Um, but no, we get an enormous number of people who, whose dogs, they sing to the theme tune, they jump up and down when the programme comes on, the cats are jumping all over the screen trying to catch the birds or the butterflies, whatever it happens to be. So yeah, maybe there's a, maybe there's a short film to be made about how our programme appeals to other animal species, not just humans. Radio. There's been such an outpouring of love for Autowatch and the fact that last year it was sadly axed from being a full series. Do you know if anything is being organised like last year? Will there be sort of small, the one show VTs or is there going to be anything bigger this year? Can you say anything? I understand if you can't, but... Well, no, plans are afoot. Um, we are conscious of the fact that, you know, we lost Autumn Watch. We lost it because of, you know, money. That's what it comes down to. Uh, the BBC's had, you know, quite draconian impositions when it comes to its licence fee under the previous government. So, you know, we've got to cut our cloth. Um, and as a consequence, unfortunately, we lost Autumn Watch. But, yep, yeah, we're talking to the one show. We're hoping that we can integrate that. I'm very hopeful that we might be able to get some young naturalists on screen as well. I'm very keen to invest in, you know, future, um, you know, wildlife presenters, cameramen, sound, sound well, camera people, I should say, um, and, 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 and sound people as well. So across the board there, we're doing everything we can to inject youth into the equation. Um, so there is that. And then we'll be back for Winter Watch after Christmas, which is still in the diary. So that's good. Also, I'm a huge Spring Watch fan. I've actually watched it since 2005 with Bill Oddie and Kate Humble from the very humble beginnings. Um, and I'm just wondering, obviously, next year, actually, somehow or other, is going to be the 20th anniversary. Um, are there any plans? Have you already had discussions about having any form of special celebrations with Spring Watch, the sister shows? Yes, we have. We've had those conversations. Uh, we're very conscious of the fact that it's an anniversary. We will be certainly conducting a review looking back, not only at the way species population relations have changed, some have increased, some have declined, uh, uh, obviously during the course of that 20 years due to climate breakdown and, and various other factors, but also the way that we make the programme. Um, because in 20 years, technology has changed quite radically. And we are able to do things now which we couldn't do five years ago, let alone 20. So we'll certainly be looking at that. Hopefully we'll be reaching out um, to some of those former presenters. You mentioned Bill and Kate, of course, as well. That would be great um, to bring everyone back together to talk about you know, how things were and how things are. So yeah, we're conscious of that. And we're looking for locations at the moment. We haven't entirely decided where we're going to be going, um, but uh, hopefully somewhere where we can bring people the best of British wildlife with that reflective um, uh, component to it. And we have seen significant changes in the last 20 years. And I've got to tell you, many of them are not good. Some are, there's no doubt about that, but many are not good. So, you know, we will be highlighting as ever what people can do um, to alleviate the problems the natural world faces, certainly on their own patch in their own back garden. But what's really incredible about this rock is that it has the capacity to change our planet's atmosphere. What was the experience like when you were filming Earth? And recently it's been announced that you'll be doing another series, Evolution. Very, very excited. Evolution has come a long way since Charles Darwin. Um, and uh, we want to really update people's understanding of the science of evolution. So it's going to be a, a fresh look at that. Um, we travel in different ways now. I have to say that 15, 20 years ago, making a series like this, um, we would probably go to three or four locations per programme. We don't now. We go to one. We try to do as much in the UK and Europe as possible. Um, we try to minimise our carbon footprint. It's, that's part and parcel of what we're trying to, uh, in, to do. And we're doing very well in, in, the, in the wildlife science part of the industry and what we learn from our practices we're trying to dispense elsewhere. But yeah, very excited by that. The Earth uh, project was was went down really well. It was a big story to tell, four and a half billion years of our planet's history. But we were using that as a means of looking at our planet in the contemporary terms as well. So many of the events that have taken place in the past had parallels with the way that we we're impacting the climate and biodiversity loss now. So there was an underlying mission there to keep people very much in the present, as well as looking back. Um, you know, millions or billions of years. And then also you and I believe it's Megan have been doing Celebrity Gogglebox recently. How different is it to be kind of almost the ones being watched by the cameras? <laughs> have you ever thought about that particular irony at all? <laughs> yeah, we, we have discussed that. Yeah, we've got the little, little remote cameras watching us, watching other people's programmes. Um, Megs is a great fan of, of Gogglebox. So she said, you know, come on, let's do Celebrity Gogglebox. I don't watch that much TV. I, and like most people, I watch what I like. When I go on to Gogglebox, they show me things invariably that I that I, I don't like as much. It wouldn't be as much fun if they just put things on and you know, like I love Fake or Fortune, the BBC show about art. You know, 
I could sit there and eulogise about that all morning, but wouldn't be as entertaining as them flashing up Love Island, which I don't have a great affinity for, I've got to say. So, um, yes, hopefully we've managed to sort of, um, you know, be, be amusing um, behind the behind the scenes, as it were, with their peeping cameras. Definitely. And I think it would be fascinating if we had like an animal version of Celebrity Google Box where you just throw random bits of TV in front of some of our animals, but maybe maybe wouldn't fit the, the, the criteria for what you should be doing with them. But it would well, probably you be say amazing. That. You, you say that, but we do get an enormous number of pictures and videos sent in of people's cats and dogs watching um, Spring Watch. Um, and they definitely respond to the screen. I've got two dogs. One of mine watches TV, the other one doesn't. It has to be something quite dynamic happening. It has to be quite a sort of a, I don't know, fast moving sci-fi action film. And then Sid will watch the TV. Um, but no, we get an enormous number of people who, whose dogs, they sing to the theme tune. They jump up and down when the program comes on. The cats are jumping all over the screen, trying to catch the birds or the butterflies, whatever it happens to be. So yeah, maybe there's a, maybe there's a short film to be made about how our program appears to other animal species, not just humans. Finally, I really wanted to ask you as well about your amazing series Inside Our Mind um, and the fact that you're actually bringing it back for a second series, which is looking at ADHD and dyslexia and other neurodivergences. Um, how much does it mean to you how successful the autism di di documentary was? And what are you looking forward to exploring with these next episodes? Well, we're in progress, as you say. In fact, I'll be working on it tomorrow. Uh, so we're making two programmes, as you mentioned, one about ADHD and the other about dyslexia. And I think these are two uh, you know, conditions which are much misunderstood still. Our mission with our first programme, which focused upon autism, was to display the lived experiences of four autistic people so that the audience could understand what it was like to be them in some way, some part of their personality and character, not wholly, but part of that. Um, and the method that we chose was to make short films. Um, they basically scripted those and crafted them, edited them. They were very much a product. We were there simply to supply the, you know, the skill base for them um, to, so that they could explain to the audience. And it was very popular. It's being used by healthcare professionals and it's been widely viewed all over the world, in fact. And people tell us that it's, it's had a profoundly positive impact on the autistic community. I would argue that ADHD and dyslexia are... are still more misunderstood now perhaps than, than autism. And so we felt there was a duty to serve those communities if we could in the same way. It's going really well. We've got some fantastic contributors again, speaking very candidly and very articulately about what it's like to be them in certain situations. Um, and we also want to address some other bigger issues, um, black and ethnic minority groups, what's happening there when it comes to diagnosis? What about women being diagnosed later in life? What are the impacts of not getting early diagnosis if you're a girl or a woman and so that uh, and then there was also an issue of a, a very high number of neurodiverse people in UK prisons um, so we're looking at some of the more um, outside of the the condition itself into the sort of societal impacts that that can have uh, as well but yeah uh, we're very excited to be back in production and we hope that it serves as a, a similar purpose for for these two communities because I think they really need some help and from my point of view you know I remember what it was like being an undiagnosed uh, autistic youngster way back in the 70s and the 80s it was really tough and I don't want it to be tough for young people anymore so anything we can do to increase the scope of understanding then that's got to be a good thing. Can you tell us a bit about the campaign with Animals Asia um, and what it is that you're working to promote? It's come to light through Animals Asia, a brilliant charity, um, that more than 17 million UK tourists have been disturbed by animal cruelty when they've been travelling around the world. In fact, one in 10 so that it completely spoiled their holiday. And we know that when we travel overseas sometimes, we do witness animal cruelty or exploitation at a level that we are not accustomed to seeing any longer in the UK. Top of the list was Spain in Europe. We don't have to go very far, probably because they still allow wild animals in circuses in some parts of Spain. They still have dolphin parks, which we've outlawed in the UK. Um, on many Spanish beaches, you can pay for selfies. You shouldn't, I hasten to add, uh, with monkeys and apes. But then even in some cities, and not restricted to Spain, but in many parts of the world, you can pay for a horse and carriage ride around that city. And people are reporting that the animals are in poor condition, sores, problems with their eyes and ears.
areas, particularly their hooves walking on that tarmac, very often not a provision for shade, not enough food and water, so on and so forth. So a whole plethora of things that are being reported. More exotic animals, it's um, elephant rides as well. And then animals that are being trained to do things which are solely for human entertainment and they're not reproducing natural behaviours. So that's things like chimpanzees riding bicycles and that sort of stuff. And, and these things are ruining people's holidays. So what we're asking them to do is if you continue to see this during the course of this holiday season, please report what you see to animalsasia.org because there is a law in place. There was a law put in place by the last government which would restrict UK tour operators from offering tickets to places where there is animal exploitation or cruelty. The problem with the law at the moment is it's not very specific. It's not easy for those tour operators to make a judgment on what might be construed as being cruel or exploitative. So we want to add some finesse to that law. By gathering this data, we can do that, go back to the current government now and say, look, come on, let's put some polish on this and make it fit for purpose and give these tour operators a fighting chance of getting it right. And obviously it can be quite an intimidating thing to sort of come across something like animal cruelty abroad and know that you want to report it, but not necessarily want to get involved at the time. What would be your advice for someone if they think they have seen something or they're seeing something? What should they do? Well, firstly, obviously, don't perpetuate that trade. Don't buy a ticket. Don't pay for that selfie. Don't pay to go in or, or, or and try and discover, uh, discourage others from, from doing so. Um, document it. We've all got our mobile phones now. Um, so document it again, without paying for it, obviously, and then come back and report it. It's only if we know what's going on that we can do anything about it. And I should stress that some of the UK tour operators have already taken a very keen interest in this. Thomas Cook have looked rigorously at the way that they structure their offers to uh, tourists that are using their services, and they're doing everything they can to weed it out. Um, other people have stopped uh, advertising it in their in-flight magazine. So there is a will there. We just want to make it easier for these people to make sure that they can offer UK tourists proper experiences when they go overseas and we're not saying don't look at animals well you know if you want to in engage in ecotourism where you watch the animals in their natural surroundings from safe distances you don't interfere with their behavior and ecology then of course we're everyone's up for that but not you know going to tiger parks in in the far east jumping on the back of elephants or going to dolphin parks in Europe. Oh yeah definitely engage responsibly. And when it comes to Animals Asia, don't forget the website, animalsasia.org. If you do witness any cruelty or exploitation whilst you're on your holiday, document it. Please report it to us so that we can go back to government and, and strengthen that law and make experiences better for wildlife and for people too. Radio.